Okay, today we are going to cover our last two readings in comparative biomechanics, which will be our last two readings in the class. Uh, the first one here, number four, will, uh, after from the previous lecture where we uh, demonstrated that chimpanzees are uh, quite a bit stronger pound for pound than humans, or just quite a bit stronger even without accounting for, for the differences in mass. Um, in, the, in reading number four here for comparative biomechanics, we will examine a case where that strength appears to help them, and then in reading number five, a case where it doesn't seem to help them. Um, reading number four here is a paper in 2006 by Scholes et al. titled Vertical Jumping Performance of Bonobo Suggests Superior Muscle Properties. Um, I briefly mentioned bonobo last time, but if you, if you aren't remembering what, what animal that is. Um, a bonobo is also a, a primate, a, a, a member of the great apes. Um, all primates aren't necessarily great apes, but all, all great apes are primates. Um, the bonobo is a animal kind of similar to a chimpanzee. They sort of physically look like chimpanzees and strongly resemble chimpanzees. They're just quite a bit smaller than chimpanzees. Um, a typical like adult bonobo might be about 70 pounds or so, and a typical adult chimpanzee will typically be in excess of 100 pounds and maybe up to like 150, sometimes 160 pounds. Um, so bonobos are quite a bit smaller um, in terms of size and, and mass uh, than both chimpanzees and humans. Um, so a comparison here of jumping performance uh, between an animal that's quite a bit smaller than, than most full-grown healthy adult humans. Um, so they had uh, four humans who jumped as high as they could and measured some of their biomechanics, and then uh, a group of eight bonobos who jumped as high as they could and measured some of their jumping biomechanics. Um, how do you get a human to jump as high as it can? Well, you just ask the human, please jump as high as you can. Um, how do you get a bonobo to jump as high as you can? You don't really. You just have the bonobo stand around the lab, and hopefully it jumps, and hopefully you measure how high it jumps, and hope you have, do have it do this several times, hopefully, and just record the jump where it jumped the highest. So you don't really know if they're truly, like, jumping as high as they're physically capable of. Um, this is just the, the, the highest jump that they managed to, to record uh, when the bonobo felt like performing this task. Okay, how did they do? Um, the results here, and here you can see a video of little bonobo there doing a jump, and you can see the results here, if you just look closely, are pretty darn good for the bonobo. Look at the air that guy's getting there above the ground. Um, how high did he jump exactly? That is in table two here. Um, the first eight rows here for jump heights are the individual um, highest jumps recorded for the eight bonobos. And then down here, where it's labeled human, is the highest jump recorded um, for, the, for the humans in, in the jumping. Um, so the bonobos jumped in the neighborhood of 50 to almost 80 centimeters for their jump height, whereas the best human did a little bit over 30 centimeters. So even the worst performing bonobo uh, completely smoked the human by like 20 centimeters, and the best performing uh, bonobos jumped over twice as high as the best performing human. Um, now these humans were healthy, young, adult, physically active males they were described as. I'm guessing they were probably students at, at the university where, where the study was done. So good, healthy, young people, but not necessarily like elite jumpers. What if we compare these uh, bonobo jumping performances to really, really good jumpers, like top-level jumping athletes? Um, there's a comparison there in the bottom parts of this table, um, a 1995 study where the uh, top-level athletes had average jumps of 43 centimeters, and then a little bit later on, one on, on, on another group of top-level athletes who jumped 47 centimeters. Um, so even there, with, with, the, uh, with the top athletes uh, getting out-jumped by the worst jumping bonobo in this study, and again, just getting completely smoked by the best jumping bonobos in the study. Um, how did they do this? Um, at least on one of the bonobos, they did an inverse dynamics analysis of uh, what their major uh, extensor muscle groups, the hip extensors, the glutes, the uh, knee extensors and the ankle plantar flexors were uh, doing in terms of how much work and how much power they were performing uh, during the jump. And they found that the uh, power output and the amount of work performed specifically by the hip muscles were on the order of twice as big as uh, what would be expected like pound for pound on a, on a normal animal that size or on a human that size. So producing uh, superhuman amounts of uh, work and power uh, by their muscles in general, but specifically by the muscles that, uh, that extend the hip, the, the, the glutes and hamstrings and muscles like that uh, in the bonobo here. Um, so from those results where it produced uh, more force, by, or presumably more force by the muscles resulting in more work and more power at the hip joint, uh, that, that's far beyond what, what a normal human muscle would, would be capable of with reasonable assumptions on strength and things like that. Um, from there, they conclude that these animals must have a superhuman, what they call here, specific force. 
Um, that's that specific tension variable that we introduced last time, the force per unit cross-sectional area, or the, the intrinsic strength of the muscle. So uh, suggesting, or at least their conclusion here, was that in order for the bonobos to achieve these jumps, um, they must just have muscles that are intrinsically stronger than, uh, than human muscles. That's the explanation they came up with here for how an animal that's like half the size of a, of a healthy uh, human adult is able to jump over twice as high as a healthy human adult. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily a, a super strong explanation for this result, or for this result. Um, for, uh, for the uh, explanations that I think are more likely, I still lean towards the, the neural inhibition hypothesis, the idea that uh, humans are not so good at truly fully activating our muscles because we don't often have the pressures and the stresses of needing to do that, whereas uh, animals like this uh, have to uh, more fully activate their, truly fully activate their muscles on a more frequent basis uh, for survival pressures and fleeing from predators and finding food and, and things like that on a daily basis. So uh, not necessarily ruling out their, their idea here, it is indeed possible, and there is some evidence that uh, uh, great apes like uh, chimpanzees and, and bonobos may have intrinsically stronger muscles than humans, um, but I don't think the difference there is enough to account for such a vast difference in muscular power output and, and performance in something like this. I think something else also has to be going on, and it's possibly that neural inhibition hypothesis. Okay, so an example here of where the extra strength of, um, the, of, a, of a great ape, even a small great ape here, um, seems to endow them with performance in an athletic task that's far beyond uh, what a human uh, could do. Uh, we don't necessarily know why that is, whether it's a neural component or a, or a muscle tissue type component, but through some combination of those things, uh, an athletic performance here by a, a, a genetically human-like animal, if you buy into the, the genomes being pretty similar, that's far beyond what any human could probably ever do. Okay, um, the last reading here will be an example of a case where... Uh, chimpanzees do not perform quite as well as humans. Um, they don't actually have any data on chimpanzees in, in this uh, study. It's very difficult to get a chimpanzee to do an experiment like this in a lab, um, but this is on the notion of the task of throwing. Um, humans are kind of unique in the animal kingdom and especially unique amongst uh, primates and the other great apes in that we are, uh, to my knowledge, the only species on earth that I know of that can take an object and can throw that object for both um, power and accuracy. So I can take an object with my hands and I can throw it and I can not only throw it fast but I can throw it with good accuracy. And we are pretty unique in, in that capability. Um, other primates like chimpanzees will, will throw things and will use tools like humans do uh, but they're not anywhere near as good at us as the uh, accuracy element of it. Um, chimpanzees are strong, they can throw stuff hard, but they can't really throw stuff accurate, accurately. They seem to not have the, the coordination to combine the strength with the, uh, with, with the accuracy and with kind of the, the, the elegance of the movement needed to, to throw uh, something both fast and accurate and to hit a target at a high speed. And uh, humans are, are, are pretty good at that, and you can appreciate this anytime you see uh, human sports that involve throwing at a high level, like a javelin or, uh, or uh, field sports like uh, baseball pitchers or, or quarterbacks in football. Just remarkable throwing ability in terms of both the speed and the accuracy with which we can uh, throw projectiles. Um, this is a, a suspected to be an important uh, element if you buy into the evolutionary theories of how humans came to be the, the, the current state of the human body. Um, humans definitively uh, did not evolve from uh, animal that resembled a modern chimpanzee. We, 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 uh, no evolutionary biologist that knows what they're talking about thinks that humans evolved from chimpanzees. Um, the theory is that sometime in the past like six to maybe eight million years ago, um, we did evolve from a common ancestor of chimpanzees that was probably physically more similar to a modern chimpanzee than a modern human. But, but humans definitively, is in, in, in evolutionary biology, nobody thinks that humans evolved from chimpanzees. We've both been proceeding along our own evolutionary lines for, for millions of years. But we, we, in theory, had a common ancestor many millions of years ago that was more like a modern chimpanzee. Now, that, that evolutionary path of humans is interesting because uh, humans are, of course, the dominant species on planet Earth. We, we kind of run things around here. But that's interesting because physically, as you've seen in some of these comparisons to animals, we're far from the most impressive animal on a physical basis in terms of physical prowess. Um, in particular, we are not very uh, strong compared to a lot of human-sized animals. We're not very fast. 
Uh, we don't have any any claws or fangs to of, of, of any great danger. We don't have uh, any hide, so we have no no natural weaponry and no natural uh, defenses. So how is it that we've been able to basically control the earth and dominate all other animals on earth? Well, one big factor is our brains. We're, we're the smartest animals, we're the smartest species in the animal kingdom. And because of those brains, we're also able to augment our physical ability by making and using tools, such as being able to, to hunt faster, uh, stronger, more dangerous animals than us by making tools like, like spears. And uh, so the, the pressure of being able to um, overcome our limitations in, in natural defense and natural physical prowess by using tools and making tools is thought to be one of the big reasons why humans are such good uh, athletes in terms of throwing on a comparative basis. Uh, we needed that ability to be able to survive, to be able to, uh, to hunt and uh, chase down prey and get the food that we needed to, to survive and to flourish as a species. At least that's one of the, the, the many theories on why humans uh, are, are the way we are physically and why we walk upright on two legs instead of on four legs and things like that. Like that well maybe we needed the the two arms to to fashion tools and to handle tools and to throw spears and stuff like that um, but regardless of why we have that ability or why we think we have that ability we are really really good at throwing we're much much better at throwing than our, our close genetic relatives the chimpanzees who are strong and can throw stuff hard but they can't throw it for accuracy so what is it that makes humans uh, really good at throwing why are we so good at throwing um, here they put forward uh, three theories that aren't in competition, all three of these things can be happening uh, uh, in, in synchrony. Um, three ideas or theories on why humans are so good at throwing, and they think it relates primarily to the shoulder and to our ability to store and release elastic energy in the shoulder as we are throwing. Um, so the ideas that they have here are, I summarized them in my document here, um, human anatomy for throwing versus chimpanzees. Um, they say we have a long torso with uh, uncoupled hip rotation and shoulder rotation. Uh, we have greater humeral torsion, and uh, we have an orientation of the fibers of the main muscle of the chest, the pectoralis major muscle, uh, that is more conducive to throwing. Um, describing what these things are and how they might help with throwing is, is difficult here, so I'm gonna pull up my video and try and demonstrate these things. So let's get a new movie going here. And see if I can arrange this so you guys can see most of me here, hopefully. Okay. So the first thing that they talk about in terms of an advent or an adaptation for humans uh, for throwing is that compared to a, a chimpanzee or to most great apes, we have a, a relatively long torso, like the distance from our hips to our shoulders is a relatively large fraction of our height compared to your average, uh, uh, average other great ape other than humans. Um, what they think this allows us to do is, and the way they describe it in the paper, is an uncoupling of shoulder rotation from hip rotation, or the other way around to an uncoupling of hip rotation from shoulder rotation. Um, what that means is that when I rotate my hips in the transverse plane here, I don't necessarily have to also rotate my shoulders. I can uncouple those things. So if I want to stand here and just rotate my hips like that, I don't have to rotate my shoulders much while I'm doing that. Or I can rotate my shoulders and don't necessarily have to rotate my hips much. Okay, So I can move my hips and my shoulders in that transverse plane separately. Um, a chimpanzee or a great ape would have some difficulty doing that. Their trunk isn't uh, quite as long and quite as flexible, and so they'd be moving more like this when they were doing that rotation. They would ro rotate their hips, and they'd also have to rotate their trunk and their torso and their shoulders in that same direction as they rotate their hips. Now, why is that beneficial? Um, this involves the uh, mechanics of throwing in terms of that wind-up whip-like motion for throwing, where we talked about this quite a while ago in class, but just to review, um, the notion that I'm moving not all my body segments at once, but moving this, them in this whip-like sequence. Okay? With each motion of each progressively smaller segment in that kinematic chain benefiting from the kinetic energy of the previous segment moving in the chain. So constantly moving uh, part after part after part of the body in this kind of whip-like sequence to constantly be adding more and more and more kinetic energy to my fingertips and to the object that I'm holding to throw it faster. Now, how does uncoupled hip rotation from shoulder rotation help with that? Well, I'll try and demonstrate that. Um, look what happens here, and let's just kind of hold my arm here in a, in a cocked position. Um, look what happens here 
in terms of getting my arm and my hand and my, my ball in my hand going forward with a fast speed when I just simply rotate my hips here independently of my shoulders. Watch what happens here to the speed of my hand and my arm and my shoulder. So simply by rotating my hips like that, I'm able to, without even doing anything with the rest of my body, because that rotation is uncoupled from my shoulder rotation, by simply rotating my hips, I'm able to get a lot of speed and a lot of kinetic energy on the rest of my upper body, even without explicitly using those muscles to speed up that object that I'm holding. Okay? Um, also, another thing that's happening there, another perspective on that, is that as I rotate my hips here, if my shoulder and my arm stays put, then what's happening is I rotate my hips, and it's kind of hard to see here in my black shirt, but I'm rotating my hips. This is opening up my shoulder and stretching one of my main muscles or uh, main muscle groups here for throwing. My, my pectoralis major muscle and part of my deltoid muscle group there, stretching those muscles and putting elastic strain energy in them and in the shoulder, and also stretching them up onto that uh, strong part of their eccentric force velocity curve. So all beneficial things for eventually giving this ball a real fast velocity and a lot of kinetic energy as I let it go there. Um, that that uh, kind of starting that rotation with your hips and the notion that your hips and your, 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 your legs and your core can contribute uh, meaningfully and, and critically to an activity like throwing is a, a big thing in, in baseball and in football and in javelin, any sport that involves like throwing something uh, for speed and accuracy. Um, this is why when you see pitchers, they tend to have, and this, this is not just true for pitchers, you know, that, that kind of starting the swing with the hips and rotating like that is true, it's important for all base offensive players too. Um, but for pitchers in particular, they tend to spend a lot of time working on their legs and working on their hips and working on your core. And you might kind of, if you don't know much about baseball, might think, why does, why does that matter, right? Pitchers, you got to have the arm, right? Arm strength, arm speed. Well, the core, the hips and the trunk and the core can be really important for uh, proper pitching form and for the speed at which you can throw something with and for harnessing that speed into accuracy at the same time. Uh, all involves a lot of good strength and coordination with those muscles on the more proximal parts of the body, right? Pitchers don't necessarily have to have like big bulging shoulders and biceps and forearm muscles to be good at throwing, but you got to have some strength in your hips and your core to, to, be, a, to be a really good, uh, fast, accurate thrower. Okay, other element here that they talk about for throwing is what they refer to as humeral torsion. Um, that's a little bit difficult, I think, in the description to figure out what they're talking about. Um, what they're getting at there is this picture here. Let me highlight that with my rectangular selector there um, in figure 1B. Um, what they're getting at there is the orientation of the arm um, when you're doing that shoulder rotation. Okay? Um, that's going to store some elastic energy in the shoulder as well, but through kind of a different mechanism and a different muscle group than what we talked about uh, with the previous mechanism. Um, so, when I'm, suppose I'm doing my, my throw and you freeze me here with my arm kind of cocked like this, and let's turn to the side. Um, as I start rotating my trunk, as I start rotating my, my hips and my shoulders, and if I leave my arm kind of cocked and back like this, um, what that tends to do is bring my arm back like that, okay? Getting everything going to my left here and bringing the arm back like that into an externally rotated position of the shoulder here. So moving the shoulder um, through kind of the uh, momentum of the rest of my body from this position into this position, an externally rotated position. Um, what that does is um, stretches a different group of muscles that's really important for throwing the rotator cuff. Um, that's actually a surprisingly, it's not a muscle group you hear that much about. A lot of people I think don't even know where that muscle group is. And it's one of those things that nobody ever pays any attention to until it gets injured. And then you see somebody in the gym doing like a rotator cuff exercise. Nine, nine times out of 10, that's somebody that's had a rotator cuff problem. Um, but it's a really important muscle group for throwing because it involves that motion. It controls that internal external rotation motion of the shoulder, which is critical for throwing, um, especially doing external rotation with what's a pretty large, strong muscle group, the rotator cuff muscle group, uh, can put a lot of elastic strain energy in the shoulder and get a lot of that energy back as kinetic energy when you then internally rotate the shoulder later on in the motion. Um, last bit they talk about here. Um, and uh, uh, for, for that mechanism there. Uh, for chimpanzees, they have an arm that because of their shoulder anatomy is more oriented like this when they're trying to throw something. 
And so instead of my arm being oriented like this, imagine if it's kind of up like this, and then when I do my, my hip rotation and my uh, shoulder rotation, then my rotator cuff isn't really that involved. Okay, then I'm just kind of uh, opening up my shoulder and still stretching the pec and, and a little bit of the deltoid, but not really doing that much uh, with the rotator cuff there. So kind of missing out on that uh, in the chimpanzee because of the anatomy of their shoulder and the orientation uh, of their humerus in terms of how it sits uh, in the socket there of the scapula. Okay, last bit they talk about here is the uh, orientation of the pectoralis major fibers. Uh, pectoralis major is the main uh, muscle group of the chest. It's involved uh, primarily in uh, moving the, or uh, adducting the humerus. So moving it from a position like this to a position like this. It's also involved in moving it uh, from kind of a, a extended posture here or a, or a flexed posture here into an extended posture here. That's mostly deltoid, but you get a little bit of pec there too. So another motion that's pretty important for throwing. Um, the orientation of the fibers in the human pectoralis major is pretty much straight laterally from the sternum um, out to the shoulder there. And that's important for throwing because then when I'm like this and I'm, I'm cocked and I'm ready to get my, my whole body going forward and ready to start uh, contra contracting that muscle and getting my, my humerus going forward so I can kind of finish the throw here, um, then I'm stretched like this and my fibers of that big strong muscle that are important for the next phase of the motion are stretched with a lot of energy and a lot of force in them and are ready to directly contribute to kind of contract uh, directly into the direction that I want to get the, the whole arm moving. Whereas in a chimpanzee, if you look at their orientation of those fibers, it's directed more, uh, more in the upward direction. So it'd be more like pulling the arm down like this which isn't quite as good as, as, as what you might want for throwing. It's not really the direction where you want to get your, your mechanical energy going for a throw like that. So three cases, or, or three examples of uh, human anatomy where despite our, our relative lack of strength in our muscles compared to chimpanzees, um, because of kind of the overall uh, shape and construction of the body, uh, seems like we're especially good at uh, throwing despite the lack of strength. And this is kind of, this kind of echoes what you see in uh, individuals who are good throwers. Like, like the best pitchers in baseball, the guys that can throw the hardest, aren't necessarily like the biggest, strongest guys in the field. Uh, maybe they just have really good form, or maybe they just have uh, a really strong core and really strong hips, which aren't like the, you know, the show muscles, the gym muscles that you work on all the time. Okay, that is it. Uh, congratulations, guys, for reaching the end of the uh, material for Kines 402. Um, like I said, this is the last video. Uh, no more videos. This is the last one. We've, we've exhausted all the readings and all the, uh, the, the uh, video lectures. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that this is the first uh, fully online course I've ever taught, and I, I know it always didn't go completely smoothly, so thanks all y'all for the, the summer term here for putting up with uh, some of the hiccups that came up. Uh, I've been super impressed with you guys' level of engagement so far and the quality of the work you've turned in, including the homework so far and the projects I've seen so far, uh, so thanks for your efforts. Um, exam will open up uh, midnight tonight, I guess. Today's Thursday as I'm recording this. I'll, I'll open up the exam uh, a little bit later uh, today and, and, and set that start date for, uh, for having it available for you guys anytime uh, until uh, the end of the day uh, tomorrow on Friday. Uh, good luck on the test and enjoy the rest of your summer and stay safe and stay healthy. And uh, for those of you graduating, uh, congratulations. And I probably won't see you again, but congratulations anyway. And uh, for those of you still uh, sticking around at Maryland for another semester too, maybe I'll, I'll run into you again sometime. And uh, thanks again, and uh, have a good rest of your summer, and take care.